Welcome aboard Just Jets with your captain, Matt O'Leary. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Hello and welcome to Just Jets episode number 96. What's going on? I am Matt O'Leary. Going to be hanging out with you, getting into your voicemails as always. Uh, but we before that, we're going to have a few topics to get into in the monologue. A couple of things that get me fired up, folks. And it's the Jets Twitter slash Jets fans against the Jets beat. We'll go through that. What happened there? And then... Is there really Jet fans out there that want to trade Quinn and Williams? Is that really a discussion that I had to read on Twitter the other day? This is where we're at right now. God almighty. So before we get into all that, a word from Manscaped. Listen up, fellas. 2021 was brutal. It's almost New Year's, though, which means new balls with our sponsor from Manscaped. Manscaped is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming, offering precision-engineered tools for your family jewels and helping out 2 million men all over the world get rid of hair on their balls. If you let yourself go in 2021... Totally understandable. That's why Manscaped is here to help you reboot and stay clean in 2022. So here's what you do. To get 20% off and free shipping, use my promo code JETS20. That is J-E-T-S-20 for 20% off and free shipping. No matter where you are, get yourself the Lawnmower 4.0. You have the cologne, the body wash I've been using now too. It's absolutely something you're going to want to check out. So Keep that in mind if uh, you have a little extra cash to spend after the holidays. Maybe you got a, a gift card or, or cash. That's where I would spend it. Anyway, let's hop into the monologue to start today's show. So we'll first start with the ridiculous notion of some people wanting to trade Quinn and Williams. So I saw on Twitter, um, I w- I'll get the exact quote, actually. I, I had it up on the regular Excuse me, not on the regular show. On I'm getting my shows mixed up here. On Jets Talk 24-7's channel last night, if you don't watch on Tuesday nights from 8 to 10, myself, Ryan from Jets Talk 24-7, and Green Bean do two hours of Jets Talk every Tuesday. It's an absolute blast. So if you haven't you know, checked that out, it's something that you absolutely should. Uh, I might have went too far here and scrolling back looking for this. Uh, Okay, here we go. This is a comment from U Stadium. And it says, man, what a battered bunch. In November and December, eight games, Quinn Williams had 16 solo tackles, 24 total, one sack, zero forced fumbles, and is a part of the team that gave up over 1,200 rushing yards, 162 yards per game, fourth worst, and oh, and stop voting him to make the Pro Bowl. He doesn't deserve it. If selected to the Pro Bowl, it will ensure a pay raise of about $5 million on his fifth year option. Trade him this offseason. So, I don't, what, what are, what's the plan here? If you trade Quinn and Williams, let's play this out. What do you think you're getting for Quinn and Williams? Maybe a, a, another first, I think you, he's a first round caliber. You're getting a first round pick back for Quinn and Williams. That's how good he is. You're hoping to then draft a player like Quinnen. And the funny thing is, I didn't want to take him third overall. I would have rathered went a different direction, but this is completely different than the Jamal Adams and Leonard Williams situation. Number one, the position he plays, getting after the quarterback. Jamal Adams was one, unhappy, two, not a premium position, paying him big bucks, didn't make sense. They traded him for a ton of picks. Okay, rework your roster. Trading Leonard Williams made sense because you just used a draft pick third overall on Quinn and Williams. So now you have this guy who's been in the league for three years and is a really good player, a Pro Bowl caliber player on the interior defensive line. No one is saying that he's Aaron Donald, but is he a damn good player? Yes, he is. Would they be even better of a defensive line if they actually had somewhat of an edge presence? Also, yes, they haven't had one all year because Carl Lawson hasn't played. Uh, Bryce Huff barely played this year, and he's a rotational guy. And Vinnie Curry, who they brought in to be depth, missed the entire year with an injury. Do you just want to continue to kick the can down the road here? You have to win games eventually. 
And what this defense wants to, how many times do I have to say this? What this defense wants to do is get after the quarterback, right? It's built around the defensive line. Look at Ulbrich's history in this league as a defensive coordinator. Look at Robert Salah's history. In San Francisco in 2019, the reason why that defensive that defense was so good was because of the defensive line. And clearly, based on the last few drafts, what they've done in free agency, they are prioritizing that defensive line and said, hey, we will get by in the secondary with later round picks. Bryce Hall, later round pick. Michael Carter II, later round pick. Brandon Eccles, later round pick. Yeah, you got to add more to that. But what good does trading Quinn and Williams do? Is this really a serious discussion that we are having here at this point? The Jets have very little talent, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And you want to trade him? And again, this isn't comparable to Jamal Adams because he plays a position that this defense actually cares about, which is getting after the quarterback. I understand the run defense stinks because they don't have any linebackers. That's why. C.J. Mosley, there's only so much that he could do, and he's tired out the second half of the year. Gerard Davis, who they paid to just be, I don't know, a capable starter, stinks. Quincy Williams, He's a nice rotational guy. Is he someone that you probably want to start 16, 17 games for you on a good team? Probably not. Outside of that, who's playing linebacker? Who? They don't have anybody. I just... You acquire these future assets in hopes to get Pro Bowl caliber players at positions that matter. And then the Jets find one and you want to sell them down the river? How long do you want this playoff drought to go for? 20 years? 15? You're not making your defense any better by trading Quinn and Williams. You're not making this team any better by trading Quinn and Williams. I like John Franklin Myers. I'm glad that he got paid, and I'm excited because next year he will more than likely go back to the interior where he belongs and not having to play on the edge because that's just not his strength. But it should be him and Quinnen. We saw last year how dominant they were. This year, they've been pretty good. Have they been amazing? No, but they've been pretty good. I just don't understand why fans have this obsession with Trading your players for capital. And again, like Leonard Williams, totally got it. Okay, you drafted Quinnen. You're not going to pay him and then have to pay Quinnen. But now you're at your spot, right? The reason why you want all this cap space is so that you could actually play or pay, excuse me, the players you draft and hit on. Quinnen was a hit. A rare one in the draft for that era. Mike McCagnon was an awful drafter, as we know. That's part of the reason why they've missed the playoffs for a goddamn decade. But you don't want to keep one of the better players that they found, a young guy. It's not like he's approaching 30 years old. He's just reaching his prime right now. It's not like the debate of whether or not you should pay Marcus May. Because Leonard Williams not close to 30. I mean, what are we doing here? (laughs) <laughs> it's just frustrating because fans bitch and moan all day long about this team never having enough bodies. They they just need, they need talent. That's what this team is missing. They need talent. Well, then you can't take one of your rare talents that you actually have and sell it for future assets that you don't know what they're going to turn into. I just don't understand how this is an actual conversation that we're having. The, with all the issues that is wrong with this team, we're going to focus on Quinny Williams and potentially trading him? What the hell are we doing? And that's only the first half of what's angering me. The second half is the Jets beat. Oh my God. It's so frustrating. You would think, okay. We went into a little bit of rant. Again, I'm plugging the the talking Jets panel on Tuesdays, but we went into a rant yesterday on that. Green Bean did a great job. Um, I chimed in with, with why it bothers me, but 
uh, on Twitter, it, it's just it's a cesspool. It really is. The frustrating part with the Jets beat and why myself and a lot of other Jet fans are tired is because the job of a journalist is to, I don't know, report, be unbiased. That's that's not what we're getting here. It's just not. They're trying to drive storylines or feed storylines for clicks. And let's face it, like myself, Green Bean, Ryan, whichever fan creator you want to turn it tune into. Number one, it's a better option. I'm not even saying just just me. Right. I don't care if you guys like me or not. I would assume that if you're watching this, you like consuming my content, which I genuinely appreciate. But the point is, there are so many better outlets to get your Jets fix than going to the beat. Who gives you nothing? It's just the Jets defense has given up 34 points per game over the last nine games. Yet their story is how the rookie quarterback didn't do enough. What? I understand the second half was bad. He played a good first half, number one. And number two, let's go down the list of what Zach Wilson and the Jets were dealing with. The Miami Dolphins defense, yeah, they they are flawed, but they have two very good coverage corners, and they love to blitz. It's not a great matchup which is why I wasn't, I didn't think the Jets would cover. I didn't think it would be close, but they did. Number two, they're playing with their freaking fourth string left tackle. Connor McDermott at left tackle, major issue, major issue. AVT got banged up, had to come out. Dan Feeney's it. And by the way, AVT tested positive for COVID. So we are living in a world where this upcoming week against the Jacksonville Jaguars, thank God it's only Jacksonville, right? But we could be living in a world with a left side of Connor McDermott and Dan Feeney. If that doesn't scare the life out of you, then I I don't know. Get your pulse checked because I don't know what would at that point. That's the first thing. Number two, the receiving core. Oh, Keelan Cole and Denzel Mims laid such an egg against the Miami Dolphins. It wasn't even funny. It wasn't. Listen, I was big on the Denzel Mims train, beating the drum. I get it. I still at this point don't want to give up on him. I want to see if maybe next year he could reset and not, not in a prominent role, but if he's like wide receiver four, Maybe he like semi figures it out and the Jets find something because it's just insane the difference we saw in 2020 versus 2021. But Keelan Cole was brought in here to be a contested catch guy, right? That was one of his strengths. And he's a big body wide receiver. The Jets had two big body wide receivers out there. And none of them, neither of them, got any separation whatsoever. The skyhead cam of that route that Denzel, the slant that Denzel Mims ran, awful. Bad, really bad. No Elijah Moore, who's his best wide receiver, and no Corey Davis, who paid big bucks to come in here and play wide receiver. So you have that. God forbid you mentioned that the quarterback has significantly cut down on the interceptions, by the way. He has two picks in the last five games. Hasn't thrown an interception in like 80 one, it's just somewhere in the 80s, passes. Can't take that as a positive, no. Yards per attempt went up. It was over seven. That's good, right? Nope. Was there a mention of that? Uh-uh. It's how the Jets' offense looked so much better without him. Okay, hold on. Pause. Joe Flacco's big, bad offense put up 17 points. 17 Do you throw for more yards? Yeah. Did they get in the end zone? No. They didn't. They put up 17. Mike White, for how much fun Mike White was in the Bengals game, it was fun. I loved it. That was the most fun game we probably had all year, right, that we got to see. In how many games did he play? Three 
and a half maybe at most, right? Because he, he came in in the New England game. Uh, I'll call it three. It was about half the game against Indy, half the game against the Patriots. So we'll call that one. We'll call the Bengals game one and the Bills game one. So three. Hit eight picks in three games. Eight. And yes, he did. He did good things. He threw the ball all over the yard in, in terms of uh, against the Bengals. Was it all short stuff? Yeah, but it worked. They put up points. But the, the, the revisionist history here is insane. Eight picks in three games. If he played the whole year, what's that? What's that pace out to? This is a rookie quarterback with a historically bad defense, without his left tackle, without his backup left tackle, without his third string left tackle, and without his two best receivers. I don't know. I don't know what the hell we're doing here, guys. It's just un- unbelievably frustrating the takes that have come out. And that's what's going to happen in a losing season. Like, I get that, but it shouldn't be coming from the beat. It shouldn't. Don't know. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I don't have a good answer. And you think, I don't ah, uh, frustrating. Let's get into the voicemails. Before we get into the voicemails, today's video is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, it can be hard to find and hire the right candidates for your small business. That's why LinkedIn jobs made it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster. And guess what? It's for free. I know when I was looking for my last job, I used LinkedIn to try to find a good opportunity, and that's exactly what I was able to find. It really came in the clutch for me. You can focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience and use screening questions to get your role in front of only the most qualified people. So LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates that you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash M-O. That is linkedin.com slash M-O to post your job for free. Terms and conditions may apply. Let's do it. Let's get into the voicemails for today's episode. We are going to start things off with Shane in New Jersey who wants to get into Zach's performance and then the NFL draft. Hey, Matt, what's going on? Uh, Shane from Jersey giving you a call. What up, man? Uh, I just wanted to touch on two things real quick. Zach's performance yesterday and uh, what I want to do in the draft. Sure. So real quick on Zach yesterday, I actually loved what I saw. Specifically, uh, what I noticed a ton in the game was him calling a ton of audibles at the line. Every time he was, he like, touching his helmet, he was, like, changing the play, so it seemed. And he was doing that all the time, which I love to see. I think it's a huge step moving forward. And he's getting more comfortable. His play yesterday was a lot more comfortable, so it seemed. Specifically on the audibles, too, that trick play where uh, Keelan Cole was going to throw him the ball for the touchdown, it seems that he audibled to that play. And quite frankly, it would have worked. I know it's hard to, you know, call that play and execute it, receiver throwing a good ball. But the the sky view of the end zone, Zach was open if, yeah. if it worked. So, he you was. know, uh, the second half was hard on him. I'm not really holding him against him because he's working with nothing and was running for absolute uh, his life against two really good man coverage corners and absolutely no one to throw to. So all in all, I really liked what I saw yesterday. He has to put it together two weeks in a row now. Uh, but that's that. Two for the draft. Maybe a hot take. I want to see where you are on this. Obviously, uh, Thibodeau and Hutchinson are top two guys, I think, for everybody. But where we might end up 3, 4, 5-ish, personally... I would go Linderbaum. I know crazy mm. high, right? But I do think that A, center is insanely important. And for the next 10 years, if you can have Zach and his center together, you know, through it all, you know, nice little cute couple thing. Uh, <laughs> I think that's awesome, especially if he's a beast. Two, I don't know if he gets past, you know, the Giants and stuff back to us at the Seattle thing. Because uh, they really need somebody. I don't know who else is going to pick up there, but I think he's really good and I think he might go high. You know, maybe you don't think it's worth it. I get it. I kind of just want to see where you are. I think we could use them. And I also think the other players that are going to be in that, you know, three to eight range, I would take Linderbaum over all of them. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, my stance on everything. Love the show, man. Keep it up. 
Uh, go Jets. Be good, brother. Thank you, Shane. Appreciate you checking in with us here. Uh, I'm going to work backwards here because I remember your the tail ends of your question first before the the Zach Wilson part. So, starting with Linderbaum, you're gonna it's going to be very difficult for me to sit here and debate what you just said. And I know that sounds crazy. We're like, what? You're going to take a you're going to take a center potentially fourth overall. I might, and I certainly wouldn't be mad if that's what the Jets decided to do. I my guess is that they wouldn't do that. I truly am still on the bandwagon that they're going to take an edge there um but would it put would you put it past joe douglas no i almost think they would probably do evan neal um there in instead and the reasoning there is because well you could play three different positions you can play well four technically um if you want to do left guard right guard but he's played right tackle he's played left tackle and he's played guard and played all three of those positions well at Alabama, which is pretty damn close to the NFL. So while I see where you're coming from on Linderbaum, I would guess that if they were going offensive line with their first pick, I would say it would probably be more likely to be Neil than Linderbaum in that spot. As for Zach's performance, yeah, there were some things that I thought he did really well, other things that, I thought he could prove on it. I thought it was an okay game. Was it great? No. Was it bad? Also, no. Something that I did like was his ability to run up to the line, dive and pick up the first down, run up to the line, dive into the end zone, pick get, you know, get in the end zone for a touchdown. Um, and just overall looked more comfortable with the decision making at least. Uh does he hold on to the ball a little bit? Yeah, I think every single quarterback does. Or young quarterback does. Um and then the second half, they, they, they had zero shot. None. But that offensive line. They didn't. Sorry. Shane, I agree with you, man. Good call. Appreciate it. Vinny is up next. He's from Peekskill calling in with his reaction. Hey, Matt. It's Vinny from Peekskill. And I was just calling to ask you a question. Sure. What does Dan Feeney and Kirsten Dunst's portrayal of Mary Jane Watson in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies have in common? The only positive about either of them is their nice hair. Okay. (laughs) But besides that, let's move on to the game. I thought Zach played well. But God, was that offensive line atrocious in the second half. Ugh. And they're like, I would normally, this is the point where we normally blame the defense for blowing the game. But to be fair, they not only tied the game, but they also gave the offense a chance. In the final minute and 56 seconds to tie it. But what happens? We got mediocre offensive lineman, Connor McDermott, decides this is the perfect time to get called for a holding penalty. My God, that just killed any momentum they had, any chance. <sighs> that was frustrating, but positives. Zach played well. After a rough game last week against the Saints, he played well. And I'm not going to complain at him. I thought, like I said, I thought he played well. And and that's, you know, the defense started out strong, waned around the midsection of the game, to the point where they were just tur- being just pushed around effortlessly. And then late in the game, they decided, oh, let's be a defense again. <laughs> it's frustrating. Can you guys please just be steady for at least the 70% of the game and not just, like, 40? Is that so much to ask for? But on the bright side, the season's almost over. I look forward to the draft. And I got to say this, I agree with you on your take with the safety. The number three edge rusher will make a hell of a lot more impact on this team than the number one safety will on the board. That's just a fact. It's a much more valuable position, and I will agree with you on taking the number three edge over the number one safety. That's all. Feliz Navidad, and go Jets. Chaotic call, Vinny. Um, A lot going on there. A lot going on. Um, Okay. 
uh, you have such niche comparisons. That's <laughs> the Spider-Man and uh, Dan Feeney one. That was pretty good. As far as it goes with Zach, I mean, yeah, I, I kind of said it. I thought he was. I thought he was okay. There were some things I thought, especially in the first half, that he did really well that excited me. And in the second half, I mean, the defense was just an absolute joke. They've get, they're giving up thirty four points a game. I don't know what you could possibly do, and in that spot, don't know. It's just it's it's bad. They need they need bodies. They they really need help on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, and they have three games left. So we'll see what Zach does over the final three games. I would imagine that he should look decent against Jacksonville. The one thing that scares me is just the left side of the offensive line being an absolute joke. Um, Tampa Bay has a ton of injuries right now. So maybe he could look okay then. Um, Buffalo's still, in my opinion, they're going to have things to play for in the final week of the year. So... Uh, he's going to go up against a really good defense there. So that's going to be a major, major test. But uh, we'll see what happens this week. I think this is their last shot at a winnable game. And there's a debate even if you want the Jets to win or not. I'd say yes. I would li- I would rather see the young quarterback play well and then win a game that they're supposed to rather than continue this never-ending trend of tanking for draft picks. We're going to do Chris up next. He's in Ronkonkoma. And he has reaction as well. What's up, Max? Chris from Konkoma. Love your show, by the way. You do a fantastic job. Thank you. Good work, my man. Just listen to other people talk about the Jets and other podcasts and all the other news stations. It is so frustrating. Do people not understand this team is a total rebuild from top to bottom, from left to right? Or should we just give up on Zach Wilson and fire Rob Asala and just start over, (laughs) draft some guy out of whoever is available next year. I don't even know. It's just so frustrating. Cause you never hear anyone talk about Trevor Lawrence. Yep. Because he ain't lighting up the stage as much as I think Trevor Lawrence is going to be a great quarterback down the road. But we got to give Zach Wilson time. Everyone's so so impatient. I get it. We're Jeff fans. We, we want to win. We want to hold our heads high on a Monday. But people just got to relax. But people not remember Peyton Manning wasn't great. His first year, I'm, if I'm correct, I'm pretty sure he led to have a, a stat for most interceptions by a rookie was Peyton Manning. I could be wrong, but he wasn't amazing. You never know. Got to give him time. He's a rookie. But as always, gang green, brother. Thank you. Yes, you're right. You have to give him time. You have to. I, I don't see how you could be like, ah, oh, he has 10 starts, nine full games, but that's it. We know he can't play at the position. I don't I don't know how anyone could possibly do that. To me it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. What what for for what? For in this quarterback class? Who are you taking? Don't I I don't know. I don't know, man. It's just it's frustrating, but there's a lot of people who who feel that way. Surprisingly, and I think the biggest reason for it is the burnout with Sam. Like we we saw a quarterback who had promise in his first and second year and then just took a swan dive in year three and fell off a cliff. And I think people who are are just tired of waiting for Sam to figure it out are carrying that over to Wilson and just have no patience, which I don't think is fair on him. Nobody was out on Sam Darnold after nine starts. I don't think, you know, the, the same thing should be done for Zach. Or 10 starts. And what the hell was Sam's record at that point? In his first 10, in his first 10 starts, I think they they won probably two games. No, three. Detroit. Denver. He also missed a couple. They won four games that year. They beat Detroit, Denver, Buffalo late in the year. And the one more game that I just can't remember off the top of my head. Someone will screw the Colts. There you go. Those are their four wins in 2018. So really not all that different. But oh well. Joe Trumbull, he's he's back. We're gonna call it Joe's weekly Zach update. I hope we get three or four more of these. 
Hey, Matt. Joe from Trumbull again. What's up, dude? Um, I, I don't know if I'm going to make this a thing, but this is this is uh, Joe's weekly update. <laughs> I'm on here Zach for Wilson. it. I'm here for um, it. I think he did good today. Obviously, I'm just stating the obvious. That first half was stellar. And I guess you could say one of his problems, but obviously it wasn't necessarily his problem, is he gets the first half down, and then when it comes to the second half, it's a little bit slower. And it just it seems like it's harder for him to get down the field. Obviously, this week, O-line issues, all the injuries, everybody's dropping passes. But it's definitely clicking for him. Like, you can tell things are coming together, the wheels are turning. Like Salah says, it just has to click, and I think it's finally clicking. And we'll definitely see that next week. But it comes on to this point. I've been on Twitter today. I've been, been seeing this stuff, and I'm conflicted. I do want to beat the Jaguars. I love to beat Brady at home, and I love to beat the Bills. But there is a chance that if we lose out, we get the first-round pick. And... My opinion, I would 100% trade out, get punt on the stock, maybe trade it to a team within the five range. If somebody falls in love with the quarterback, we can get a big haul, maybe two or three first, which would be insane. Maybe I'm talking too crazy. <laughs> but I would love to know your opinion on that. Obviously, I want to win. I'm rooting for Zach to get better. But if we can lose in style, falling with style, to quote Toy Story, oh, great I think that quote. would be great. <laughs> Thank you for taking my fall. Best of luck. Have a great week, Matt. Let's go, Jeff. I agree with you on the Zach update, by the way. Um, I think he has shown like incremental progress, but I don't know. That's not fun or edgy to talk <laughs> or talk about. Like if we're gonna be realistic here, like excluding Mac Jones with the other three quarterbacks or uh in Fields, Wilson, and Lawrence. Fields has probably been the best of those three, but you, you could really make the case that Lawrence has been the worst one. He has one touchdown since November. One. It's been really bad, but I'm not out on, on Trevor. I don't think the Jaguars should be looking to draft a quarterback this year. Give him a shot. Same with Zach. Um, and as far as the wanting to win or lose, it's complicated. It really is. I'm kind of more on the side of I would love for the, this young team to, I don't know, win, win some games and like have the young quarterback look good. But if they go out and win against Jacksonville like 6 nothing, that, then that that helps nobody. It doesn't. Well, I guess the defense would play well, and maybe that's a positive spin, but I don't know. Maybe best-case scenario is like they lose 34-31 and Zach goes for like, I don't know, three touchdowns and 300 yards. That'd be good, but it, it's complicated because, yes, getting one of Thibodeau or Hutchinson – would be incredible for this team. It, w- it would take the defense to another level. It really would. And with uh, Hutchinson or Thibodeau and Lawson on the other side with Quinnen and John Franklin Myers in the middle. Now, now, that's a goddamn defensive line right there. That's a good start to building something. But also, if you tell me, hey, like, I don't know, the, the Jets win against Jacksonville, and even if they lose against Tampa and Buffalo, but Zach looks good, and they end up picking four, then you know what? So be it. I'm kind of just going to go numb to whether they win or lose and whatever happens, happens and just rooting for the young guys to play well. That's kind of where I'm at right now. It's different than last year. We, we knew what was happening last year. It was the quarterback and the coach had no future here. None. They didn't. They were going to start fresh. So it was more advantageous to root for losses at that point. Because wins on the back of Frank Gore, Sam Darnold, and Adam Gase meant nothing for you. But this year, it's it's different. You're not tanking for a quarterback. So it, it's again, it, it's there's a lot of gray area. It's not black and white, but it's interesting. We're gonna do Devin in Nevada, and thanks again, Joe, for calling in. He wants to talk about Mike Lafleur and specifically Booth Lafleur. What's up, Matt? Uh, Devin from Nevada calling in. Um, so at the beginning of the season, I was one of the first callers to call out Michael Floor. Uh, after the Jets' first three games, they were averaging six points per game, and that's what had me hitting the panic button on the floor um, because in the NFL, that is really just unacceptable. But, um, you know, at this point in the season, um, I'm glad to be have uh, proved wrong on that. And, um, you know, I really think that it was more or less Zach's fault kind of making, you know, LaFleur look bad at the beginning of the season. 
um, because we saw what Mike White and, you know, Flacco were able to do and even Josh Johnson. Um, but, you know, Booth of Floor and Field of Floor are two totally different coaches. Booth of Floor is creative and refreshing and intelligent. Uh, he can read the whole field and knows when he can take his chances, though I think he should take a few more. And, uh, you know, I think as he continues to get comfortable being himself, you know, as this off, this uh, OC, he actually will uh, do really well. And I'm excited to see what uh, he can do with some weapons. Uh, my favorite plays from the Dolphins game was uh, Zach Wilson getting that four-yard scramble, I think, for a first down. And he gets up and gives a little move in the chain celebration. Yeah, man. I love to see that because at BYU, you know, people were saying that Zach's confidence was one of his weapons. And uh, he hasn't had too many opportunities to build confidence this year. So, you know, to see him show a little swag, you know, I love to see it. True. Um, also, Zach has to run the football more because he does have speed and he gets shifty. And my second favorite play of the game was Zach catching the defense with 12 men on the field. That put a smile on my face. That's the first time yes, I, sir. That I saw the Aaron Rodgers aspect of Zach's thinking process. You know, so going into this next season, I think that um, without exaggeration, this is the biggest offseason in Jets history. So, uh, you know, I'm excited to see how they build off of this. You know, and there's actually things to be positive about, believe it or not. Uh, you know, so if the Jets can't get KT, Evan Neal, or Aiden Hutchinson with their first pick, I'd actually prefer to trade down. That's fair. Um, you know, maybe secure – uh, some picks from the Eagles if they would give up two first rounders or something like that, that'd be nice. But yeah, uh, yeah man, I'm actually excited for the for the Jets next year. Unfortunately, uh, uh, in December we're always looking forward to the next season. But that's a fact. Um, you know, I really do think that if there is ever a time to turn around the Jets, it's got to be next year, man. By this point in the season, the Jets need six dubs at least by this point of next season. Um, anyways. Let me know what you think, brother. Love the show. Keep it up. Go Jets. Thank you very much. I I agree with pretty much everything you just laid out there for us. And listen, Devin was honest with us, folks. He said he was someone who wanted LaFleur out. We like that. Accountability. That's a good thing. Listen, I've had many a take that's wrong. And I think we should hold ourselves to high standards. So I give Devin a lot of credit there for talking about LaFleur. Booth LaFleur is absolutely a different person. As for the rest of it, yeah, it is probably the Jets' biggest offseason in their lives. It, it, it felt that way for the last three years, but it's right again. This year it is. Wow. I feel like we do say that every year, but that's where we're at. It's another big offseason for the New York Jets. And for Joe Douglas specifically, man, because they got to start putting some wins on the table. There's a lot of things that Joe's done that I liked. There's some things that he's done that I haven't liked. I think there's been some whiffs in free agency um, and some points in the draft that are a little bit of a head scratcher. There's been some really good things in the draft. But if they're three and 10 at this time next year, then, I mean, he's probably gone. So hopefully he, he wins some games because that the, the excuses are running low. For Joe Douglas at this point. You got to start putting some wins together. Ryan from Florida's next. He wants to get into LVT. Let's do it. Ryan from Florida. So I was listening to Jets Talk podcast on my way home from work. I work midnight as a cop down here. And my question is, I know LVT is not going to be, or he's going to be a free agent. And he's definitely in night and day for DVR. And I understand the whole uh, Linderbaum draft pick, but if we re-sign LDT, what about taking like Garrett Patterson or somebody else later in the round instead of Tyler Linderbaum? Uh, just curious on your thoughts on that. Thanks. Have a good day. Yeah. Um, he is definitely an improvement over Greg Van Roten. There is no denying that. I don't know if he's shown me enough where it's like, yep, I am completely fine with going into him as the starter next year. If you want to retain him, get somebody else and have a competition, I'm probably okay with that, but he's been, he's been up and down. He has. Um, man, the, the Jets still need some work on this offensive line. It's not a completed product, so um, I would probably like an upgrade there. Uh, whether that's in free agency or the NFL draft, it really depends. I, I'm I'm good with either. Um, it's a weird year where in 2019, right? No, 2020. Excuse me. 
everyone knew that the Jets needed to take an offensive lineman first. And in 2021, everyone knew that the Jets had to take a quarterback first. This time, there's multiple directions that the Jets could go, and you could make a strong case for a lot of them. And a lot of it is contingent on what they do in free agency, which happens first. So, yeah, maybe there is a, w- a world where they want to go with Linderbaum, depending on what breaks in free agency. It, it's just, it's not an answer that I like giving or want to give, but it, it's almost too early to tell because it depends on what the plan is, which I think we'll have more answers in the coming months here. But I, I, I think that he's been better, um, but they, they definitely... Um, should look to improve with with a more of a long-term answer there in my eyes. We're going to do Jeff in Jersey. He wants to get into tight ends. Hey, Matt. It's Jeff from New Jersey. Uh, and I just wanted to talk about a position today that the Jets have neglected for probably 10 years now. And that is the tight end position. Um, I mean, it is highly underrated in this league. You know, you look at teams like Kansas City and San Francisco where – their offense is revolved around a tight end, and especially in this offense, we really need one. So, um, you know, this this coming free agency, there's like two big ones, I would say. Um, there's Mike Kosicki, who I would stay away from. He seems, he's just very inconsistent, and he's not good at run blocking and pass blocking. Um, but the guy I would probably go after if I'm Joe Douglas is uh, Dalton Schultz from the Cowboys. Bingo. Uh, I don't uh, think he'll be able say. to afford him. And I think he would be a really good addition uh, to this offense. He's really good at pass blocking and run blocking um, and receiving as well. And I would get him for Zach Wilson because, you know, they're, they're, uh, tight end is a rookie quarterback's best friend or yep. young quarterback. You know, it doesn't matter. But, um, you know, would you would you rather attack that position in free agency or would you rather attack it in the draft with, like, guys in the second or third round, like, I don't know, Isaiah Likely or Jalen Watermeyer. They seem like the top tight ends um, in the draft, but they might go in like the second, third roundish. So I don't know, uh, Matt, just let me know and go Jets. Sure, absolutely. I agree. The Jets desperately, desperately, desperately need to rebuild that tight end room. I like Dalton Schultz a lot. That was the exact free agent I was going to give you. But... It can't be just Dalton Schultz. You would then have to draft somebody as well. They need to do both. They need to sign a free agent and draft somebody because the the room is just that bad. I cannot do Ryan Griffin, Trayvon Wesco, Tyler Croft as a tight end room next year. That would be um, almost a fireable offense, honestly, for Joe Douglas. Seriously. How he's neglected the tight end room and kicker specifically is just insanity, to be completely honest with you. I would say Dalton Schultz and then look at a tight end in either the second or third round. Like someone who could be an impact player. I'm not saying take one in the first. I don't even know if there's a a tight end who is going to go in the first round this year. But like Schultz and Trey McBride, something like that. I can get down with that. They really do need tight end because they need to round out this. The weapons like everyone's saying this whole draft should be defense. I, I hear you. I get that. But at the same time, like. You look at all the good offenses in the in the league. They have multiple weapons. It can't just be Corey Davis and Elijah Moore and Michael Carter. It's not enough. They have nothing at tight end, and they still need more at the wide receiver position. So I, to answer your question, they need to do both. They need to sign somebody like Dalton Schultz, who I happen to like a great deal. Uh, I don't think it's going to be Jacecki. Um, I, I, I that's honestly I. Before you even said his name, Schultz was going to be the one that I brought up. I think it would be a good signing and draft one. So I'm with you. Dom from Long Island is back. Dom, how's dad life? Your wife didn't kill you after calling in from the hospital? Love it, man. Thank you for checking back in with us, Dom. Let's hear what do you got. Hey, Matt. What's going on? It's Dom from Long Island. Uh, so a couple things I wanted to get to, so I'm hoping that I can have enough time here. Uh, first thing, I think we've seen it in the last few games, not all year, but Sky Braxton Berrios is just continued to prove he's an asset to the team. I mean, clearly not our number one or number two receiver, but he's a great kick returner, great punt returner, 
Um, you know, I've never really seen him muff a punt or a kick, which is one of the bigger things. And he's got good field vision. I think we re-signed him this year to a two- or three-year deal. I just don't think we're in the position to, like, you know, be giving up assets at this point. You know, if we have a good kick returner, good yep. punt returner, reliable receiver, I think we should, you know, lock him down. Um, with that being said, I think the receiving room needs a little bit more work than we had originally thought coming into the season. Mm-hmm. I think it's still lacking a ace wide receiver or like a true X wide receiver. And I think we get that receiver in the first round of this year's draft. I've been banging on the drum for this guy for months now. At first it was unpopular because we wanted Linderbaum, but I'm telling you with that second first round pick, obviously I think the first first round pick we should go edge. There we go. It's Carl Loftus or whomever. That second pick, we need to get Garrett Wilson. I think he's a as blue chip of a blue chip offensive prospect as it comes. Okay. I mean, I feel like he's just put in so much work over the last few years at Ohio State. And a wide receiver room for Zach with Wilson, Davis, Moore, Berrios, and then, you know, whoever else. I think that that can make our offense elite. And then, you know, also in addition, you had maybe a tight end in free agency. You draft a tight end and do things like that to where we're really building a, you know, impenetrable front, I guess, or weapon stable. But, yeah, that's all my, my thoughts. Uh, let's go Jets. Love it. Thank you, as always, Dom. I think you bring up a lot of good points. I agree. I would not be opposed to going wide receiver with that second pick. I think it's smart. I also think that they have to bring back Braxton Berrios. And I know that might come as a shock to some because I was labeled as a Braxton Berrios hater, which isn't the truth. I think he's a good special teamer and a depth wide receiver. I just didn't think he should be a focal point of an offense. But if he is a, I don't know, wide receiver five for you, okay. And a good and a good kick returner, punt returner, cool. I'm good. I'm good with that. I'm absolutely good with that. I just don't think he's a focal point of an offense on a good team um but there's value in in having a good special teamer so yeah bring him back i don't think it's gonna be costly and as you said they one they have money and number two like why i don't know why, why not keep your players who are pretty good at their job so i'm with you i, I really agree I, they definitely need to continue to build the wide receiver room um, because it needs work. I, I, it's a good start. I like more and I like Davis, but, but there, there needs to be some more there. Speaking of wide receiver room, we're going to close out with Rob from Smithtown, Long Island, who still wants to talk wide receiver room. Rob, what do you got for us, buddy? Hey, Matt, this is Rob from Smithtown, <clears throat> Long Island. First off, just want to say I'm a huge fan of the show. Thank you. Um, one of the more positive things to look forward to as a Jeff fan, but Basically, what I want to talk about today is um, I don't think that Zach's the problem. Um, you know, a lot of other holes to fill, but the biggest hole that I'm, I'm seeing that I'm very frustrated with is obviously the wide receiver room. You know, on paper, it looks like we did a decent job in the off season, but, you know, with Davis down for the season and more out, you know, there's nothing, nothing at all except the Saints game. And, uh, you know, just watching it live, you just absolutely no separation. So that's a big problem and there's no other really weapons to to work with on the other hand so you know how is that how is that going to help us out i think we need to make a big addition in the off season not a big addition but another solid addition just to give more and davis a hand next year maybe even at the tight end position i don't know we just yep. you know we can't be relying on two guys on our offense so it's basically it yeah you're right rob you're 100 percent right they need to continue to add more i like Michael, probably even bring back Tevin Coleman, to be honest with you. He was had significantly more in the tank than I thought he would. So, Carter, Tevin Coleman as your main one-two running back. Good there. Tight end, you need two. And wide receiver, you probably need one who's solid. Whether you want to do that in free agency, trade, the draft. It's up to Joe Douglas, man. They're, they're, I am good with whatever. They just need bodies in here badly. Tight end, sign one, draft one. Wide receiver, you can either draft one. And it would have to be high or trade for one or sign a big name. 
that's I think the move. So that's going to do it for me on episode number 96 of Just Jets. Appreciate you guys hanging out with me as always. Please make sure to subscribe, whether you get it on YouTube or in audio form. Really helps a lot. I appreciate all the love and support. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll catch you next time.